Okay, so I'd like to welcome you to the Peter Schein Interdisciplinary Study Abroad Poster Session. Today we're going to have a series of presentations uh, from students who have done their research. Okay. If you wish to ask a question, you can do so in the chat feature, or you can raise your hand and answer uh, and uh, orally ask your question at the end of the presentation. I'd also like to tell you that we have a Peter Shine event between Tuesday and Friday to so please look at that calendar and participate in, in, as, in as many events as you can. Okay, so our first presenters, I would like them to please introduce themselves and uh, make their presentation comparing uh, prevalence of healthcare acquired conditions in rural and urban healthcare facilities in the United States. And Michael, so, would you, Michael, would you please put up their poster, please? Um, and, and Joshua, when you present, remember to turn on your microphone. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Zamet. I'm one of the um, undergraduate senior nursing students that participated in this research project. And I'm Joshua Steven. I'm an under, uh, another undergraduate uh, nursing student who also participated in this research project. And Dr. Jameson is here as well, who helped us with this research project. Um, okay, so basically, healthcare acquired infections. So we did our research on comparing healthcare acquired infections in different facilities um, in the healthcare facilities in the United States. So between rural and urban facilities. To put it simply, healthcare acquired infections is any kind of ailment, infection, or it can even be an adverse event on being in a hospital that the patient did not originally come into the hospital with. So this can range anything from a fall that took place in the hospital that the patient had never sustained any injury from at home. It could be any kind of pressure injury that the patient sustained in the hospital any kind of infection from catheter associated infections, central line associated infections, pneumonia, sepsis. So the list goes on and on. There's a myriad number of different categories of these healthcare acquired infections. The reason they're very important and are oftentimes untalked about or not talked about as much um, is that when patients come in, they may have a prolonged stay in the hospital. So they are actually the sixth leading cause of death in the United States per year, and it results in 99,000 deaths, which most of the time they could have been prevented. One in 31 hospitalized patients are diagnosed with an HAI at some point in their stay. And when a patient sustains an HAI, the Center for Medicaid Services does not reimburse the hospital for any kind of infection or HAI that they sustain while in the while in the hospital, and this costs approximately 70, uh, 7.2 and 14.9 billion dollars that a, a, for additional hospital costs for treating healthcare acquired infections in the United States, which is a massive amount of money that could be potentially allocated elsewhere in the healthcare system. So we conducted a literature review and what we found, I mean, there wasn't really much to go off of. So there was, but in this literature review, review we were trying to find discrepancies and disparities between perhaps there's data on rural facilities and how well they did with preventing healthcare acquired infections and the incidences of healthcare acquired infections within their facilities and also with, um, between like rural and urban. So who did it more, where there's an instance of more, who had better outcomes, and also who had more preventative factors within their hospital or in their facility to prevent an HAI. So what we do know from our nursing education is there is discrepancies between rural settings and urban settings when it comes to healthcare. Uh, food deserts, access to resources. These are all things that are known and are taught about in our nursing curriculum. 
and that we as healthcare future healthcare professionals are going to have to be taking into account and taking into mind as we going in, as we are entering practice. Um, and the reason we should care about these kinds of problems is because by being able to figure out a way that we can prevent HAIs from occurring and perhaps eliminating certain disparities in urban communities or in rural communities, we may perhaps see a lesser incidence of these happening, better patient outcomes, and overall just better health care across the lifespan amongst these populations. Right. Um, so our search strategy, we used PRISMA guidelines uh, for, and we looked at published literature between uh, 2016 and 2021 on CINAHL, uh, ERIC, PubMed, uh, the Web of Science Academic Search uh, Premier, and Medline. And we used search terms including uh, healthcare acquired uh, infections, hospital acquired conditions, uh, and, and urban and rural. Our uh, criteria for articles included um, was that they were published in English. The research study had at least one outcome reported, and our search yielded uh, 2,000 articles, and of these we used 13. Our results showed that in general, uh, rural hospitals had fewer cases of HAIs and HACs. Um, however, this is not always the case. Um, some research did suggest that urban hospitals um, had a better prevention of uh, deep vein thrombosis and also present, uh, prevented uh, falls and pressure injuries uh, better than their rural counterparts. Um, however, uh, our other research showed that rural hospitals had fewer incidences of hospital-acquired infections like uh, catheter-associated UTIs, uh, multi-drug resistant uh, organisms and P. Originosa, and the implications for nursing practice are the uh, more research on urban and rural hospital hospital acquired conditions um, needs to be done. There is a lack of research in this field, especially comparing the two. Um, we also need to include outcomes and uh, patient demographics in the analysis. Lots of our, our data pulled was not only from nursing research, but also from like epidemiology and what, and um, yeah. And we need to expand the research uh, to eliminate healthcare disparities between urban and rural hospitals um, within the context of hospital acquired conditions. Um, because we do want to reduce the incidence of these across the U.S. Thank you. Are there any questions? Actually, I have a question if nobody else does. It's a librarian type question. So is there a mesh term for this that you would have searched on CINAHL or Science Direct or wherever you searched? Were you able to find a medical subject heading for this? Um, not really. A lot of the like research doesn't directly compare the urban versus rural. Um, I know for like the articles I looked up, I was looking at a lot of epidemiology journals and looking at the data that they had between like urban areas and rural areas, but not so much within like the nursing context. John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a little bit of a struggle trying to find um, research on the topic. It, it seems that this topic is really not looked into heavily that much. And we kind of were just going off of basically um, the best evidence we can find between I'm, I'm talking about this disparity. Um, and it, that could be another reason as to why perhaps some of the findings are as is, is that hospitals may not take the time or research journals may not take the time to actually research the subject itself. Um, yeah, it was just, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was hard to find some stuff. Yeah, I can take a little dig for you because if there's a mesh term, it would make it easier. And you may have to look at, you know, studies that aren't directly comparing the two, but studies out of rural hospitals versus 
urban hospitals. But it's interesting. It sounds like there's a, a rich vein of research there. Um, I see Heinrich has a question. Yes, I do. Um, that was a great presentation by you guys. And so my question was between uh, rural hospitals and urban hospitals, do you think that disparity in the frequency of HAIs is caused by the patient density in the hospitals? Or a better way to phrase this is, how much do you think patient density in hospitals have a part to play in HAIs between rural and urban hospitals? That's a great question because we actually did come up with our own hypotheses um, about why we, some of the results came out the way they did. And some of them had to, some of our hypotheses did have to do with pa patient density in the hospital. You're just going to see lesser um, amount of people. Um, my thinking, one of, one of my thinking was oftentimes if you have a hospital that's, you, some of the, they call them critical access hospitals, where they are the only hospital within many, 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 many miles of, uh, of another one. And you have a very sick patient who may require mechanical ventilation or may require ECMO or may require devices and technologies that they just simply do not have or are not trained in. And they're sicker patients. They may send those sicker patients and they oftentimes do send those sicker patients out to urban facilities, out to big centers, big academic centers where they have the capabilities of, you know, of those devices and being able to keep a per keep someone alive when they're very, very ill. So we did think about that. We were thinking maybe it's like if someone comes in and they really don't have the facilities to treat them or maybe they don't have enough beds, they'll just send them out and then they might find that they'll contract an HAI at an urban facility. Um, so it's, it, it is an interesting thought for sure. And also who is sicker in these populations? Is it that rural populations tend to be slightly healthier so that they may not be bed bound as much where they won't even have instances of pressure ulcers because they're most of them are up and walking around. Um, so there's a lot of there's a, we don't really know exactly, but yeah, it's um, it's definitely something that what we found through this needs to be researched more and more because it is absolutely a chasm of information that you could potentially find regarding this topic and could potentially uh, find solutions to as to why patients are coming into hospitals and sometimes never leaving as a result of an HAI. So what I'm <clears throat> what I'm getting from this is that better hospitals are better equipped but at the same time all the very sick people are be, are concentrating at one point and that's increasing the risk. Is, is that correct? That's what there. We don't have any definitive evidence that that is the direct cause of this. It is just food for thought that potentially it is that sicker populations, but there is no evidence that does suggest that. All right, thank you. No problem, thank you. And, and I had a question also. Uh, fortunately, I've experienced this with members of my family. Uh, in one case, uh, it was the raw setting, and uh, the patient went in for just a routine outpatient procedure and ended up on life support. Um, and did you find in the rural setting that they I they have less experience with this type of event? and uh, that might contribute to the factors. This person did live, thank goodness. Josh, did you want to take that one? Um, sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, because the data that we were able to find was so limited, um, I don't ever recall coming across anything about like the experience of the nurses in the rural setting. Um, okay would not have been the nurses. It, this definitely was an anesthesia related. It was reaction to anesthesia. I'm not sure this woman be. Does the nursing staff take that information first? John, you have anything? I, uh, so was it, a, was it a bad reaction to anesthesia is what happened? 
Um, it was never determined, but that's what's thought that they, that the anesthesia that was given during this outpatient procedure uh, then caused this patient not to be able to breathe. Yeah. So those incidences, we couldn't really, we didn't really find anything related to um, medication errors, perhaps, I guess we can call that, or maybe um, an, an adverse event that happened like that, because that's when hospitals call things like that an adverse event, when something, when something like that happens and it turns into an emergency. Usually there's a whole investigation as to why that incident occurred. Um, we really couldn't find anything related to um, emergencies like that. Um, we were mainly these are our research was based around finding patients who are already there who have condition who develop conditions like catheter associated urinary tract infections where someone has a, a Foley catheter in for a prolonged period of time or perhaps during the insertion of the Foley catheter the person wasn't sterile they got a bacteria or a microorganism on it and it infected the patient's urinary tract or central line associated bloodstream infections where a patient has a central line terminates at the superior vena cava of the heart and due to perhaps they weren't cleaning it well enough that it got infected or pressure injuries where patients develop bed sores and perhaps get infections in those bed sores but it would be interesting to see if there were a difference in adverse events related to um, emergencies like you stated. I'm really not sure about that. And my other, you did answer the other question because the other one was related to a patient that was in the hospital, for, as you said, and developed a staph infection. And unfortunately, they did die from it. And yeah. so the work is very important. Thank you. And Jose has a question. So uh, excellent study, uh, uh, Jonathan and, and Joshua, um, very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, so so I've, I've read some interesting um, work that has been done by others, and you kind of alluded to it, uh, I think it was you, Jonathan, in your point that people in rural areas, um, in some cases, might might have a, a healthier um, environment. Um, it, so I, I read some studies that uh, in, in infants in particular with... Um, in rural areas are exposed to more, um, you know, bacteria in general. Um, and and uh, that bacteria effectively um, helps uh, train their immune system um, to, 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 to better cope with uh, when, when they when they get, like, as you're pointing out, uh, more serious uh, um, infections and stuff along those lines uh, versus people who are in more urban areas where where they they're they're less exposed um, to, to to such an environment, and in particular, use um, you know very sanitary things like like um, you know dishwashing machines and stuff like that that really completely eliminate all of all of that. In some cases, useful um, bacteria in the background. What did you find along those lines from, from this study? Is, is could that also be a factor, a contributing factor? So absolutely, I, I think it's interesting food for thought, and I definitely think. Because of such the limitations of this literature review and um, the lack, I would say, the lack of research on it really does make it difficult to pinpoint a reasoning or um, behind as to why this disparity occurs. So it definitely le it, it, it definitely should um, beg for more questions and beg for, you know, is this... Um, is that the case? Is it their environment? Is it their healthier populations? Does it have to do with, for, it could be a myriad of reasons. So, okay. but thank, thank you for bringing that up. I, it's, it is very interesting because the studies like that do come out where they talk about um, your normal flora in your, in your right. microbiome and how that can affect in your gut health and how that affects and perhaps your environment influences that, which influences your outcome of an infection whether yep. it's a mild one or severe one. It's a very interesting topic. Thank you for bringing that up. Yep, yep. Okay, well, thank you. This was a very good presentation. Um, and if you do have further questions, uh, you can contact me and I will forward them to the students or put them in the chat. Oh, yes, you're getting lots of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all for your time. Thank you.
before we go on to the next presentation, could Lisa or Michael please try to contact Aaron DeRay Almadrala? We have the email address in Emily four days if they have not joined the session. And I know at least one of these did want to be present for the question and answer period. Our next presenter is Nicholas. Nicholas, is Karina going to join us? Okay, well, Nicholas is here. He's going to introduce himself. And uh, Michael, would you please um, put up their presentation, Effects of Cupping on Muscle Speed and Athletic Performance? Hold on, I might have made a mistake in this presentation. What? Oh, you're going to do it? That's fine. And I'm going to make Karina, I just saw her. I'm going to make her present to you. Whoever's going to share their presentation. Uh, Nicholas, you have that access at the moment. Oh, there you are. Just I see the presentation here. here. Thank you, Michael. So, Nicholas or uh, Morena, who is ever going to? Karana, um, can you can you can you go? Uh... All right, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, name is Nicholas Rocha. I am a junior. Um, as a part of this. Um, as a part of this presentation on the effects of dry cupping on muscle fatigue and athletic performance. Um, and you, Kayara? Um, I'm Karina, and I'm currently an undergrad. I'm going into uh, DPT after my experience at Seton Hall. And um, this study really like stuck out to me because it's on uh, basically what I use right now is like a physical therapy aid. Um, Nick, do you want to share, uh, share like the poster? Yeah, got it. Give me a moment. Are you share again? Here it is. And sorry. Just hit share at the top, right? Or a uh, slideshow, sorry. So this is our uh, poster on effects of cupping on muscle fatigue and athletic performance. And cupping is one of the oldest forms of ancient therapy, which was founded in China. And cupping works by mobilizing blood flow to ease pain. And currently it's used by physical therapists to alleviate pain of injuries, such as headaches, um, allergies, um, mental health issues and different kinds of pain, such as back pain and um, knee pain. There's different forms of cupping, such as like wet cupping and dry cupping, which utilize like um, dry cupping has a suction kind of feature, which is like what our study is focused on. And wet cupping is utilizes blood, such as acupuncture to mobilize blood flow. Our goal is to confirm if cupping has a positive or negative impact on athletic performance and if it can help to reduce muscle fatigue. We hypothesize that there will be a quantified distinction between athletes who receive cupping versus those that do not. And we have two figures in our study. So figure one relates to different kinds of cupping. So cupping therapy sets usually contain six to 24 cups and a means to apply the suction. Cupping can be classified based on the type of cup used, how the suction system works, and its usage. Our study focuses on dry cupping, utilizing plastic cups with manual suction. The cups are classified as male cupping sets. And then we have a second figure in the middle, and it shows the difference between the immediate and delayed effect between athletes who have received cupping versus those that did not, known as the sham control. And the mean frequency was calculated based on bicep curls, and there there is an observable difference between the immediate and delayed effects of cupping between the sham control and the cupping group. 
cupping can be contribute to delayed effect on muscle fatigue, which can be seen in this figure as the ratio of MNF. And you can see that it increases with the delayed effect in cupping. So for the um, for our experiment, we have a series of we have a set of control groups from which we were organizing. Um, we were going to have a mixed sample group from all around the students at Seton Hall, either from the team or from athletes on campus. We are going to be observing. We are going to be observing their normal routine and set up a control group for um, doing dry cupping within before their normal routine. When we have a set of charts here, not charts, um, we have a set of tables here um, for how the experiment would be organized and what would be measured to see if there was any changes or improvements on their performance. We have we have things like push-ups, 30 yard dash, the mile run, and swimming laps for, for basics. Um, and all of these results will be recorded and weighed against the uh, control groups. And everyone that volunteers would be, everyone who volunteers would be, um, would be either paired with people very similar to each other, or there would be a large uh, control, large control, large sets of experiment groups and control groups. And we would just run the numbers to see whether or not there was an actual effect on performance. Also in our study, like the results were predicting that dry cupping has a measurable delayed improvement on athletic performance and reducing muscle tension. We also predict that there will be little to no effect of dry cupping in relation to immediate effects on muscle tension. And we also believe that there will be effects and improvement on muscle fatigue alongside muscle tension relief. And then for the acknowledgement, we'd like to thank Seton Hall University and Dr. Zhao for being able to research this topic. I see questions. Um, I'm not sure who was first, Heinrich or Melinda. Yeah. Melinda, do you want to go first? Sure, I can go first. Um, first of all, great presentation, you guys. I'm sure this took a really long time and it, your uh, effort really showed. Um, I'm wondering if you can use cupping for like any other injuries like besides a knee or does it have to like strictly be like your knee or can you do any other body part? You can do other body parts. In fact, it's used often for physical therapy specifically, not for athletic enhancement, which is what we're looking for. It's actually trying to find um, dry cupping for athletic performance has been rather difficult for us. There's not really much to go off of. But we have found um, studies for physical therapy, and I know my father, he personally, uh, he tore his tendon the, uh, a, a few months back, and that was one of the, one of the things they did for his um, physical therapy. It relieves muscle tension for physical therapy, and it was on his... Um, it was on his, uh, what was it? It was on his lower leg. Forget which body part, it, forget which which uh, muscle group it was specifically. You could, but, It's mainly used on like the back and legs and also arms. I work as a physical therapy aide right now, so that's what we use in that like setting. Um, if someone has like back pain, knee pain, you can even use it for like neck pain. All right. So, oh. uh, Dr. Oh. Lopez. So, so um, I, I know of, of cupping is uh, the, the ancient way, or at least the way the Chinese um, uh, the doctors were doing it. 
is is that they would uh, put effectively a cup and and then that they would uh, light a match uh, and and that would create the suction. How, how are these modern ones, the ones in particular, the dry method of, that you were talking about, how, how, how do they work? Can you just briefly describe that? Yeah, so it comes with like a there's different kinds of cupping sets. So like the male one has like an attachment to like a, it's like a sort of like a manual vacuum. You like pull and it like has like a suction kind of feature and you attach the two together. There's also like different kind of tubes you can attach to help create like a better suction to mobilize the blood flow. So they're, they're hooked up to a vacuum system basically that, that yes. creates the suction. D does, does it matter? If there's a, a higher vacuum or a lower vacuum, I mean, do you, do you want more suction or less suction? Does any of that influence kind of the the blood flow to, to that region where it's being used? Um, Generally, like it has directions like you do like two pumps. That's what I do currently is like you just it's like a lever you kind of pull and you pull the lever twice and you don't okay. want too much because it can be harmful. Like if you leave it on for too long, it's better to keep it on uh, for like 10 minutes. 10, 10 to 15 minutes, yeah. Okay. 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 This you. is also why we avoided um, wet cupping because it requires mm -hmm. injection or incision. Or acupuncture and too. We really wanted to stay away from that. Okay, and, and that's not as uh, commonly used by Western physical therapists, right? It's mostly the dry vacuum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mostly dry cupping. Okay. Thank you, good, good job, nice presentation. Uh, Dr. Jamison. Myself. Hi, good morning. Excellent presentation. Um, I had a question because um, we use cupping in, in nursing, for example, if like someone has cystic fibrosis um, to um, help drain their lungs and to um, keep um, and consolidation from impacting in, in the lung tissue. Um, what I am wondering is like, are uh, is cupping, I have, I'm not familiar with it to tell you the truth is um, you're explaining it in physical therapy. I haven't had to have physical therapy in a while. But do they leave marks on the body? The reason I'm asking is because um, many of us um, probably even sitting in this room here are like mandated reporter for child abuse, for example, or elder abuse. And sometimes those I've seen them on the, um, um, when you light a match underneath then it can leave a ring on a child's chest or a body part and then you get kind of suspicious about what you know what left that kind of mark if you're not familiar with cupping does, does that happen with the kind of cupping you're describing yes it can i personally had it done to me but most people it doesn't leave a mark for long it generally goes away it's only like really it's not, I don't know, like people like Michael Phelps, I don't know if you've ever seen him, but he has like cupping marks all over his back, but I'm sure he gets cupping done quite often. So I guess it depends on like the frequency as well. Okay, so does it hurt? Um, it actually does hurt for like a split second, um, but then after that, it actually, you get used to the pain and it feels really nice after, like it, you can feel like the tension being like released after. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Roy? I'm thinking I should say this for Sayadka. Anyone else have a question? I don't see any other questions. I have time for one more. Somebody's echoing. Okay. Um, I noticed that your um, Athletes were in non-contact sports. I was wondering if the um, effects could also be used in the contact sport uh, injury situation. Did you study that or are you going to further your studies into that? Did you hear me? Um, so the question was about that kind of athletes were using. Yes, that they you said running and swimming, and these are non contact sports. Um, I was wondering if uh, cupping could be applied um, in the, you know hockey, football, or even basketball where there there's contact sports. Well, so yes, it can be to any kind of like pain that is that comes from those kinds of sports. It can help to relieve any kind of tension. I'm sure there's tension with all sports. Nick, do you want to like elaborate? And you did say that um, it took a while for the effects to uh, be felt. 
uh, any time range in that amount of, um, you know, hours, days? Um, there's generally like within the hour, there's, you don't notice obviously an athletic like difference. It has to come over time in the frequency. Um, usually within like a week, there are some like effects on like how you feel after working out or how after doing a sport, you'll feel like less, uh, tension. So that's also our goal is to determine the uh, time period that it's most effective. And uh, about how many times a week or a month do you give these treatments? That's my last question. Um, it would really depend on the volunteer schedule since we based our sampling on volunteers only. But our goal is to do it once a week. Do we have any other questions? If not, I thank you for a very interesting presentation. And it looks as if we have some new guests have joined us. Yes, and I have to make them a presenter. Um, Michael is going to put up their, their presentation. And I have to find them a list of which. Um, so this next presentation is a video, so I'll just wait for you guys to be ready and then I can roll the video. So the join. Finding them on the list, are they still here? Up oh, there, there. Yes. Sorry for the right here. I see oh, our Turks and Caicos people here. Right. That's right. Okay. So. Um, would you like to introduce yourselves first for the presentation of exploring cost-effective alternatives on ECMO? One, uh, your microphone's up at the top. Okay, well, then I, um, you're gonna play the presentation and hopefully uh, they will be able to answer questions at the end. Good morning, everyone. Today, I, Aaron Namanjala, along with my group mates, Brianna Michelle and Naisha Hinton, are proud to present to you all our project, which is exploring a cost-effective alternative to VV ECMO, representing Holy Family Academy, Roman Catholic School of Providentialis, Turks and Caicos Islands. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, also known as ECMO, is used to provide respiratory and cardiac support. Manufacturing costs of ECMO generally range around 150,000 US dollars. This experiment explores possible alternatives to ECMO's main components, the membrane oxygenator, a source of oxygen, and the centrifugal pump. The pH of the blood was tested after passing it through the model in order to determine its effectiveness. For the procedures in this experiment, First, we drilled two holes into the lid of the gasket box and inserted the whisk into the holes and covered the whisk with the water bottle. Next, we attached the tube to the whisk that will carry the oxygen to the Ziploc bag. After this, we filled the gasket box with distilled water until it passed the whisk and added 40 milligrams of baking soda and stirred it until it was homogenous. Next, we attached the wires onto the whisk and fill the container with 350 milliliters of store-bought pig blood. After this, we measured the pH level of the pig blood before having it passed through the machine. Then we connected a tube from this container to a centrifugal pump, which will pump the blood from the container to the oxygenator. After this, we recorded the pH level of the pig blood after this process. Then we repeated steps four through six, but mixed different percentages of water for each of the three other pig blood samples. The ratios would be 0%, 25%, and 50% of water. So for our research, it shows that during the process of electrolysis, the water molecules are separated into hydrogen and oxygen after passing an electrical current through the water. The cathode produces hydrogen while the anode produces oxygen. Usually you would use an AVG analyzer in order to determine the presence of carbon dioxide and oxygen. 
but for this experiment, we tested the pH of the blood instead. Now, due to silicone's gas permeability, the oxygen is allowed to diffuse through the blood as it passes through the oxygenator. Moreover, the presence of hemoglobin allows for the blood to accept these oxygen particles. The job of the centrifugal pump is to transport the blood back to the heart so that it can be distributed throughout the entire body. For this experiment, we use pig's blood as an alternative due to the fact that it displays similar characteristics to human blood in terms of hemoglobin content and structure. So for our results, in our model, we used centrifugal pumps that had a flow rate of 1.65 liters per minute, which did not meet ECMO standard flow rate of 4 to 6 liters per minute. But due to the fact that we mainly tested oxygenation, the weaker centrifugal pumps would suffice. We also used different ratios of water to pig's blood to account for the flow of the blood, as well as making a fluid simulation in blender. So for our results for this experiment, it shows that the pH had a general decrease. For the 100% pig's blood, it had a decrease of 4.86 to 4.83. In the 75% pig's blood, it had a decrease of 5.99, which turned into 5.86. And finally, for the 50% pig's blood, it had a decrease of 5.99 to 5.45. You can also see that there was no significant change in flow for the percentages of blood because the time it took to transport the 150 milliliters of pig's blood ranged from about 4.7 to 5.1 minutes. This is the fluid simulation of our presentation. See here that the centrifugal pump is transporting blood from the heart into the oxygenator and once it reaches a certain point it fills up to the other centrifugal pump where it is transported back to the heart and as you can see in this portion of the simulation the electrolysis system is producing oxygen filling up the ziploc bag where it eventually goes into the top portion of the oxygenator the results show that the ph decreased overall in the experiment and this contradicts the hypothesis one probable explanation would be because the oxygen did not diffuse properly through the silicone sheet. Another explanation would be because the pig blood was not fresh, it was too processed. And what this meant was that it did not have the same properties as normal fresh pig blood. In conclusion, our model did not increase the pH of the blood. Instead, it decreased the pH. To improve this model in the future, we could use a bigger Ziploc bag to contain a bigger amount of oxygen. We could use an APG analyzer to test the oxygen contents. And we could also use glowing splint to test the presence of oxygen in the electrolytic system. These are our references, and thank you for listening to our presentation. Okay, so does anyone have any questions for the students? They're here and they're able to uh, answer them. So I'm going to start out. Um, oh, Jose, please. So, so, so can you tell us a little bit about your your school, um, what grade you're in, and and, and kind of why, why you decided on this particular project? It's very, very interesting, this biomedical work. And I have a series of other questions, but could you start with that? Um, first of all, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, good morning to you all. My name is Aaron Amandrala from this Science Fair group. Here's our, these are my group mates, Nash Jensen and Brianna Mishan. Uh, we are in 10th grade in Holy Family Academy Roman Catholic School. And for this experiment, what we wanted to do was seeing how expensive and costly the artificial lungs that are used today, especially ECMO, uh, we wanted to sort of explore some alternatives that can be used to recreate this device. It's not necessarily to uh, create a prototype, but just to explore different ways to tackle this, this, uh, this issue. So, so my question said, so my understanding from what you found is that the pH uh, decreases. So that means that the blood becomes more acetic. Is that correct? Yes. It, do, do you think um, it, it might be also caused by the fact that that, that um, you're exposing the blood to air, I mean, you're not sealing well enough the, your container, and then uh, by by having the air there, it oxidizes, it introduces more more oxygen in, in, into it, so, so then that can cause a chemical reaction where it, it nitrifies, so, so the, uh, the oxygen and the nitrogen that's in air 
uh, causes the, the, the water content effectively in the blood to become more uh, nitrified, and that causes the acetic-ness. You, it might be the chemistry as opposed to the, the quality of the blood that you're, you're getting. You might consider that. I think that's also a factor that um, should be considered because given like the fragile nature of blood and that everything should be controlled when doing exper experiments like these, as you said, having the blood very sealed so that no other factors could tamper with the blood, I believe that's also a very um, good factor to consider when doing experiments like these. So, thank you. And, and my final question, so what, what time is it there in the Philippines, if I'm understanding this? Oh, no, we're in the Turks and Caicos Islands, sorry. What, what time is it? It is currently 10, 17 a.m. A.M., oh, okay, okay, Excellent. oh, okay. So, so, so how is it a.m. there? It's a 24-hour difference? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I did not understand the question. <laughs> so, so you're, you're, my understanding is, you're, well, where, where are you located? We are in the Turks and Caicos Islands, Providenciales. Oh, Turks yes. and Caicos, got it, yes. got it. Got yes, it. thank you. So, so you we're in the same time zone, perfect. Yeah. All right. Good job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, I did fire alarm is going off. Uh, hopefully, Michael and uh, Lisa can continue. Emily is not going to have joined, so if there aren't any more questions. Continue and I'll the fire drill. Uh, so we're having trouble hearing you. Um, she just Martha, said that there's a there's, there's a, a fire, fire drill, drill. Fire drill. In, oh, in her building. Fire drill. So we can uh, we can continue. Um, the next presentation would be Emily, but I I don't see her here. Uh, Emily, if you're here, could you could you um, raise your hand? <laughs> um, if we don't have Emily uh, in the interest of time, we could move on to the uh, next presentation, which would be. Um, uh <laughs> the opportunities and uh, the uh, students Francis, experience the opportunities yeah. yeah like francia is here if, if she's ready she's last on the schedule because i don't see dr amar here yet but... oh i see okay um yeah um francia would you, would you like to would you like to be next and thanks to our turk and Caicos group that was great yeah, that was awesome Good job. Francia, Thank you. I've, I've, Thank you. Francia, I've made you a presenter, uh, so you should be able to turn your uh, your microphone and camera on now. Hi. Go Hi. Um, do you happen to have my uh, PowerPoint slide? I also have a copy of it in here. I do, I have it right now, I'll share it. Uh, Perfect. Right now, there we go. Okay, um, okay. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Francea Palencia Quijano. Um, I am a PhD student um, at Seton Hall University in the Health and Medical Sciences Department under the direction of Dr. Zip. Um, so I just wanna thank um, Dr. Zip um, for helping me with the content of my research and this presentation and, and also Dr. Schoen, if I'm saying that right, uh, to giving me this opportunity to present here. So by, by trade, I am a physical therapist. And um, um, as you could see, this is my topic, the application of knowledge translation action framework, a valuable lens for clinician. It is a theory report. Um, I actually presented this at the combined sections at Texas for the physical therapy meeting. So as you could see here um, in the first column, um, we have a very big problem with falls. So according to the CDC, one in every four older adults um, is expected to fall this year. According to the CDC National Contro uh, Centers for Injury Prevention Control, um, that unintentional falls has increased by 31% from 2007 to 2016. And falls has resulted in 2.8 million emergency room visits. Falls can result in head injuries, hip fractures, and even unintentional deaths. So although not all falls will cause in serious injuries, it can also impact the quality of a life of a person. 
This can result in increased caregiver burden, uh, loss of independence, and decreased activity tolerance. Falls are one of the most expensive conditions to treat. Um, a recent study shows that uh, um, treating a fall injury can cost anywhere from $2,000 to $30,000, depending on the cost of the falls. And as the population ages, the cost of falls is expected to increase. So physical therapists can do something about this. Physical therapists like myself, we are doctorally healthcare professionals. And according to the guide to physical therapist practice, we have preventative roles for health and fitness. So a recent study by Lesser et al. shows that an emergency room visit by a physical therapist can reduce the revisit odds of a falls if it's done within 30 days by 35% and by, by 60 days within 32%. So the American Physical Therapy Association, which is also the APTA, uh, who supports our, um, our profession of physical therapy, they recommend evidence-based practice. So what exactly is evidence-based practice? So you could see that here on the very bottom left, Evidence-based practice is the integration of the best research out there, um, clinical value, uh, uh, clinical expertise, and patient values. So what are the tools out there for false management for healthcare professionals? So there are two kinds. So the clinical practical guidelines, which are systemic re uh, systematic review of the available evidence um, related to false and they can make recommendations and this is actually done through an expert pan panel um the one that it, there's one in the united kingdom called uh, nice 161 and then the one here in the united states is the study stopping elderly adult uh, death and accidents however the issue with these clinical practical guidelines is that they're not really specific to physical therapists so the academy of geriatric physical therapy published this in 2015 uh, called the um, academy of geriatric physical therapy clinical guidance statement or agptcgs uh, which is specifically for false management a content expert they met they critique and appraise multiple clinical practical guidelines that eventually derive into the AGPT-CGS. So what is what does the AGPT-CGS look like? This is the AGPT-CGS and this is how the algorithm um, goes. So when a physical therapist encounters an older adult over the age of 65, we are supposed to screen them for falls. And we can do this by A, asking if the patient has fallen within the last 12 months, Two, if they have a balance and mobility issues, or three, if they observe that they have a balance and mobility issue. If the screen is negative, then we can just proceed to the um, routine care. However, if it's a positive, um, there could be, we should do a multifactorial risk assessment. And there are two um, risk factors. One that is outside the scope of physical therapy practice, and that includes osteoporosis, urinary incontinence and depression and this risk factors we have we can refer them to a healthcare professionals but what is my role as a physical therapist with specific to the risk factors for falls so on the bottom here um, these are the ones that PTs can do something about such as decreased gait decreased strain improper footwear um, and specifically balance. So balance is a modifiable risk factor that a physical therapist can do something about. So on top of the AGPTCGS, the APTA also recommends the APTA balance test and measures, which can be found under the test and measure sections in the APTA website. And um, it's about nearly 40 valid tests and measures. So even though, um, so even though the AGPTCGS um, recommends the APTA balance tests and measures and the, and the AGPTCGS, there are key questions that PTs uh, that we ask and researchers, do physical therapists have access to these tools? Um, are, uh, are they aware of these tools? And at what point do they, um, they um, translate them into clinical practice? So, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to click the image that will come out for the for the knowledge to action framework and it's actually not coming out. 
Um, so it would be here, uh, which is there's a there's a framework that we use, which is called the knowledge to action framework. Um, it is a valuable lens that physical therapists can use to translate um, um, evidence into clinical practice. Thank you. So this is um, the, the, the theory. So you could see here, there is actually two phases, the knowledge creation phase, which is symbolized by the, um, the funnel here. And the knowledge is going through there synonymous to like a coffee filtering into this funnel. So the very first phase, it's just like you're making um, knowledge. Um, this is primary studies here, which is a knowledge inquiry. On um, the second component is the knowledge um, synthesis synthesis, which is um, meta-analysis and systematic review. However, the very bottom of this funnel is the knowledge tools and products, and we can reflect upon the AGPT CGS and the APTA balance tests and measures to reflect as the knowledge tools and products. And this is the most refined units of knowledge that PTs can use in assessing balance and false. So the cyclical arrows here um, is um, the knowledge to action framework. And this is how we can translate knowledge such as the AGPT CGS and the APTA balance test and measures into clinical practice. So the very first box here on the left side, I'm sorry, the second box is assess barriers to knowledge use. So what are the barriers in translation? So Sibley, who is a pioneer of um, balance um, research and assessment practices in Ontario physiotherapists, um, perform a study on how Ontario physiotherapists assess balance and look into the barriers. And she found mainly two barriers, individual barriers versus environmental barriers. And individual barriers would include um, lack of knowledge, which means they don't know how to use the tools. And environmental barriers include lack of time, lack of personnel to administer the tools, and the tools may not be appropriate for a specific population. So in summary, balance and uh, uh, balance and false impairments are um, primary impairments in older adults. Balance is a modifiable risk factors that a physical therapist can address to reduce falls. Um, the APTA, which is an organization that supports physical therapy practice, recommends that we use evidence-based uh, materials such as the AGPT CGS, uh, here, and then the APTA balance tests and measures, and we can use this framework as a lens to translate knowledge into clinical practice. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Sure. Actually, I have a question right off the bat. Uh, two things. Thank you for your respective copyright by putting the link in. I really appreciate that because I have to review everything for copyright. And speaking as someone whose mother was recently hospitalized with a very bad fall, it would have been really useful to have had um, some of this balance assessment and so on. I don't know if her physical therapist was doing that, but one of the things that's maybe a little tangential to your study now, she had a fall in the bathroom, which I understand is one of the most common types of falls. And to what extent is that something specifically that physical therapists can look at, like in terms of recommending, say, grab rails or um, ways to safely get in and out of the bath? So my question is, um, has she seen a physical therapist prior to this fall? She has because she has other issues. Um, she also has osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, which makes it difficult. But yes, she had been getting some physical therapy. I'm, you motivate me to go and ask. Okay. <laughs> So let's go back to that slide that I have in here. Um, you could, um, um, I'm sorry, Michael, can you look at, can, is it possible that you could um, uh, put back my, um, so you could see here multifactorial risk assessment. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that she has osteoporosis, right? So that's actually one of the risk factors for falls. So where a PT comes in is that, so essentially, if let's say she was coming to physical therapy practice, not specifically related to fall, let's just say that she has a shoulder problem or a knee problem, it is our job technically as a physical therapist to screen her for falls. So 
in, I actually work for Kessler Rehabilitation um, in one of their satellite clinics. So we, everyone um, that comes in, uh, especially if they're older adult over the age of 65, um, we are supposed to screen them for falls and then make um, the appropriate um, um, uh, recommend, uh, recommendations. But I, um, in the literature, they actually see that there was one study that only I think 21% assesses falls because there could be the physical therapists are so busy looking at other things. So I think um, as a physical therapist, I could advise um, um, is um, you could maybe per perhaps describe the uh, the uh, situation in the bathroom, like having like uh, a grab uh, a grab a rail um, to make sure she could push into it and having like a non-skid like uh, mats on the bathroom and also having like a night a night light um for when she has to go but obviously like um there are situations where the patient can't go by themselves so um sometimes we might recommend like a bedside commode like at night if it's easier for her to transfer that way but i think moving forward um as you know like there are uh, programs that are specific basically for balance and falls. So maybe after this episode, um, I would probably find a center that um, a physical therapist that can address her balance and walking issues. Yes, I think this is really helpful for those of us who have elderly relatives to be proactive about. I mean, my mother's in assisted living now sort of as a result of this, but I think this kind of information would help a lot of people. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Wiles. Thank you. Is there uh, any other questions? Martha, did you have a question? Yes, yeah. I did. And I remember some years ago that uh, one of the students presented work on uh, comparing schools in assisted living and out in the home, how many, and they came out that actually assisted living did not uh, stop people from falling. There were situations there that they did still fall and unfortunately break limbs. But my question is, uh, in a regular physical examination uh, that was, was performed uh, by your doctor, uh, do they assess balance? Is that something that's assessed? Is it, you mean, are you saying they go to a physical therapist or when they actually go to a doctor's office? No, I, I, I do mean just as a part of the general physical, because as you get older, um, I don't know, I do know in my husband's case, he was watching some exercise program and they, for, you know, and it said to stand on one foot, right? And, uh, and he had balance issues with that. And then he asked the children if they could, and of course, they're standing there forever on one foot and the other foot and all of this. And I, I just wondered as part of a regular physical, if this is one thing that's... Okay, so to answer, so to answer your question, um, I mean, unfortunately, I would say that it is not a regular assessment that a PT should do. However, if they are coming in for a specific lower extremity impairment, like let's say if they come in for their shoulder or their neck, they might not actually look at his balance. However, if they are coming in, like let's say for a hip problem, a knee problem, an ankle problem, or specifically balance and gait, then um, uh, they would actually look at his balance. So that um, information that you had brought up standing on one leg, where they had asked him to stand on one leg, that's actually one of the balance tests and measures that PT uses more so in the outpatient setting than in the assistive living. But we really should do, we really should assess um, balance in older adults. So this is, this is the, the problem here. I mean, this is what the evidence is saying. The evidence is saying that PTs should assess all older adults for falls over the age of 65. And the, these are the tests and measures found on the website in the APTA. But I don't know, um, if, if they are aware of this tool, I don't know if they know that they exist. And if they don't, then why not? So this is actually what my research is going to be about. And I'm actively doing it right now. Uh, excellent. And uh, do you know if, uh, and this might not be in the range of your research, if health insurance would cover um, the therapies, the exercises, like you said, it can often be in-home or outpatient, for balance. Okay, 
So, so this is my, so, um, Medicare, um, um, I actually work in the outpatient world. So in the outpatient world, like if you have Medicare, I believe if you're the, over the age of 65, they should cover, um, physical therapy for balance and gait training, but it has to be related to, to a functional issue, meaning, um, it cannot be like a recreational activity. It can't be say, oh, I can't play tennis because I feel like I'm losing my balance. It has to be something like, um, and the, these are the, we have these tools that we, we give to the patient, both they can a- answer subjectively and objectively. So as long as it is tied into a function, like let's say um, um, I can't bend over to pick up something from the floor because if I do, then I'm going to fall. So that's, there you go. Like the patient is at risk for falls. They have to bend forward when to tie their shoes. So it has to be tied into a function. So as long as it's tied into a function, then yes, me, um, um, insurance specifically beneficiaries of Medicare over the age of 65 should actually cover it. Yes. Uh, Jonathan has a question. Yes, Jonathan. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, I just had a question um, from a nursing perspective that, you know, when we have patients that come to the hospitals, we have to assess them for falls and how much of a risk they are for falls and things like that. And sometimes I, I find that they may be at a very high risk for falls, but they may not automatically get PT consult in an in like in an inpatient setting. Do you think we can apply this framework if they meet a certain criteria, like say they're a high risk for falls? Do you think you could apply this to an inpatient setting where they automatically will get a physical therapy consult to come and work with them, work with patients? So I think I also have experience working in acute care setting, and I think in the hospital setting, um, they're there for so many medical issues, you know, like whether it's a cardiac or it's an oncology or they had a neurological issue. And yes, balance is part of, uh, of the, it should be part of their assessment. But um, um, I think physical therapists are looking more into getting them out and moving them into the next transition. I feel like that's more of a priority, like sending them to subacute or home or um, the assisted living. But to answer your question, that the study that I'm actually doing um, to answer your question, if we can use this framework. So this is not, so the population I'm looking at right now is very specific to USPTs. So I would like to maybe look at this, um, this if nurses in the future are using some, some sort of assessment um, in the inpatient setting. And it, I'm, I'm sure it would be, so this framework here, the AGPTCGS is specifically for older adults, for community dwelling older adults. So it's not for the inpatient setting. So I think if I were to look at nurses, I would review a literate, a lit- my literature review would be specific to the tools that nurses use in the inpatient setting. Did I answer Thank your you. question? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. This is very informative. Um, since I had to leave for the fire uh, alarm, I'm not really sure where we are in the program. Um, Michael, do, do we still have uh, doing business in India? Uh, we were but waiting for Beth, but we didn't see her. So for Emily. For Emily? I have not seen Emily either, and I have not heard from Emily. Um, that was why we put Francia in, because we couldn't see uh, Dr. Amar either. Oh, Dr. Amar is not coming. That's why he sent a recorded presentation, and yep. he sent me a transcript for questions. They answered the questions. So um, I have... Yes, yeah, so we'll do that, and then we'll give Emily a chance if she... Okay, right. You know, we were sitting in the plane when a call came from uh, Maria Buzos. She said, uh, all trips are canceled and you, uh, I'm calling you to let you know that the trip is canceled. But we were already seated in the plane. And I told her, we are already here and the door is just closing. And if you really tell me for sure, I can ask them to uh, stop and let us out. She said, 
we are all meeting here and uh, the board is deciding what to do with these trips and I will get back to you. And by the time she got back to me, we were already taxing. And uh, she sent me a text message and she said, board has made an exception for you and your trip can go. So this is how our last year's trip began for India. Uh, India was at that time, in fact, not really having anything uh, comparing to pandemic that happened later. It, it was uh, only one place in India from where Wuhan students had returned or Wuhan students came and three of them tested positive and they were isolated uh, and were being treated. I, uh, that happened in late February. I asked students, would they like to travel under these conditions, although we were not going to be uh, closer than 1,000 miles uh, from that spot. Students decided to go. This picture they shared here with the audience is on arrival in Mumbai, uh, and we have our hosts there. They received us, and the way our trip is designed uh, we have what we call uh, leave your wallet home program. And leave your wallet home means they do not pay for anything anywhere. Uh, all trips, uh, airplane costs, uh, local, uh, international uh, hotels, meals, uh, gratuities, taxes, entrance fees, everything is included. And so, uh, this is why uh, they enjoy. And uh, can you move on, please? Okay. And here, uh, India uh, is by GDP is number five in the world. And based on PPP or purchasing power parity, India's economy is number three in the world. And population is at this time and at number two, 1.3.93 billion is India's population and is expected to be number one most populous country by 2027. And those projections are pretty much certain because we know uh, how people are uh, being born and dying. And so that projection is in fact from uh, the United Nations. And uh, when it comes to number of English speakers, India has number two in terms of English speaking population. Please move on. Okay. Here are some of the uh, visits we made. Uh, Indian trip is designed to give them an understanding of the business environment in India. And that also includes uh, visiting factories, visiting businesses, visiting government offices, uh, and also giving them introduction to uh, India's sociology, psychology, India's belief system, and all that. So they get a deep understanding of India. They visited a company called Inox Corporation. Inox Corporation is um, alternate energy generator like wind power and solar mills and uh, all those. It is uh, w one of the largest in India and has presence in the United States as well. Uh, students uh, were really excited by how India is moving into the clean energy or green energy area. They visited uh, Birla Institute of Management Technology where uh, our main focus was at the uh, Atal Incubation Center. Uh, PIMT or Birla Institute of Management Technology is uh, actually a funded uh, engineering graduate uh, school where uh, a company, a group of industries by the name Birla, they contribute almost everything that is needed to run this university. And their incubation center is one of the best. Here they bring students 
who want to start businesses and train them on how to start business. And then they actually uh, start their business right while they are still in the program. Uh, the business is registered. The, they even have their offices started. So when they graduate, they don't just graduate. They have in fact a business running uh, for them to go from the very second day. We also visited Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship. Uh, Indian, uh, Indian uh, businesses and schools are getting very heavily into entrepreneurship because they, they believe India was left behind during the British uh, occupation and, and had to catch up and um, they are doing a good job. We visited a pharma lab, uh, a company that produces equipment and machinery for pharmaceutical companies. Jay Shah, who is a director, was my student while he was at Seton Hall University uh, and he did his, his MBA, uh, went back. It, it was a family business. His grandfather and his father had been in the business, but his uh, impetus after graduating from Seton Hall University really expanded tremendously the business. This was our third visit to his manufacturing operations uh, and students really learned how uh, pharmaceutical industries uh, running. By the way, uh, India is the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer when it comes to generics and Within this decade, it will become the largest pharmaceutical producer of the world uh, period. And it is also right now the largest producer of uh, vaccines in the whole world. And so in, in India has moved up uh, ahead. Uh, please move to the next slide. And Dr. Amar, we have a minute left. Fine, thank you. So this is now our uh, social uh, side and um, Students had chosen to visit uh, Banaras or Kashi, uh, and on uh, two votes, they decided that they didn't want to go to any other city but Varanasi, uh, and this is their Varanasi visit. So please move to the next slide. He, here, uh, Varanasi is also the place where Buddha gained uh, his gave first sermon, and they wanted to visit that place, historical visit. We went there. We went to New Delhi where they saw uh, the government offices. They visited Taj Mahal. And here are the Taj Mahal. Please move to next slide. And here is the conclusion. So we have, uh, these are the impressions of the students, appreciation for the rich culture exposure to numerous religious groups living in harmony, view of the contrast between the rich and poor in India, understanding of how highly diverse people coexist in peace, first-hand knowledge of local companies and higher education system. And by the way, India has some of the best uh, technological institutes in the world called IITs. Insight into needs of the Indian people. This was produced by uh, students uh, led by uh, Bob Baligan, and uh, we thank you to him for making this presentation. Thank you. So thank you, Michael, for projecting uh, that presentation. Uh, are there any questions? So I would like to thank uh, everyone who participated, our presenters, and uh, Michael, our technical assistant, Lisa Rose Wild, who was our moderator, and uh, our faculty and student guests. If you do have questions, you can email them to me and I'll forward them to the presenters. Uh, please also take a look at the Peter Schein uh, exposition calendar, which is on uh, the website and uh, attend as many, participate in as many events as you can. Okay, so thank you very much, and I will be shutting off the recording. Go ahead and go for that.